Hello, good evening, and welcome to Practical Christianity Bible Study. My name is Tunde Disu. Thank you for taking time out to be part of tonight's uh, program, uh, which we couldn't have yesterday because of uh, uh, my work situation. Um, but today we are continuing with uh, the program or the topic we were looking at last week about becoming a change agent becoming a change agent that was all we looked at last week on today's program we're going to be looking at what is required what is necessary what do i have to do or who do i have to become to be recognized or to be acting in that role as an agent of change but for a quick recap we were looking at this topic last week and we said what's an agent a person who acts on behalf of another person or on behalf of a, of a group or who carries out an assignment on behalf of somebody or who represents somebody else. But if we are agent, then it means we're serving somebody somewhere higher than us. A higher authority is who we are agents to. Now, if we are his agent, it means he's giving us, he's left an instruction, a specific assignment for us to, to fulfill, to carry out. Now, I know there is the the, the Great Commission, go ye into the world and make disciples, that, that is there. But there is a specific instruction that was left for us. There was something specific that God gave us to do. And that is found in Luke chapter 19 verse 13. In Luke 19 verse 13 he said, And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come occupy till i come that i believe was our great assignment that in i i strongly believe it's the reason why we're still here on planet earth even after our salvation after accepting jesus as our lord and our savior because for all intents and purpose after becoming born again we could have been raptured and taken to heaven to live with him there thereafter but for whatever reason, we are left here on earth. There is a purpose why God in his wisdom has left us here. And that purpose, that assignment is what we've just found in Luke chapter 19 verse 13 where he said, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. You remember the Bible talks about the return of Jesus will be for him to return to a church that is without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish. Well, maybe the reason he's not back yet, maybe the reason we're still waiting for his second coming is because the church is not occupying. It's because you and I were not occupying in our sphere of influence. We're not taking possession. We're not turning the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of our Lord and his Savior. We are not delivering maximally on this assignment that God has given to us to occupy till he comes. Now, you may be wondering, what does that mean to occupy? It means to take dominion, which was our in the initial uh, 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 commandment God gave us, to dominate. Dominate what? Dominate our area of influence. Dominate our environment. Dominate the, the society. Dominate the community. Dominate this earth until the kingdom uh, that is operating here on earth resembles the, the 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 system that is operating in heaven and that is why when we pray we say let your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven well the coming of his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven will be will be determined by how much of the earth we have occupied how much dominion we have here on earth how much authority we have established concerning this planet that we live in so the, 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 the question you and I must always ask ourselves at every time, especially from this moment forward is, am I occupying? Am I taking territories? Am I becoming an agent? Am I fulfilling my role as an agent of change here on earth? Remember the Bible talks about the children of this world, the whole creation 
they are groaning and traveling and waiting for the manifestation of the true sons of God. Well, what they are waiting for is for you and I to occupy. What they are waiting for, what the whole world, the whole creation is groaning and crying and traveling about is that you and I will, will just wake up and do what we're supposed to do. You and I will just wake up and become what we're supposed to become. That you and I will, will, will get our acts together and establish here on earth the kingdom as it is in heaven by occupying because until we occupy, he ain't coming back. I know some prophets have said, oh, he's coming back so, so, yeah, he's coming back so, so. It's not true. It's not true. Until you and I, we occupy, until we take possession, until we take authority, until we become this agent, he's not coming back. He's not coming back. If we are to occupy, then he will come. The reason he hasn't come is because we haven't occupied. Our assignment, like we said last week, is to occupy by changing the status quo, by turning the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of our Lord and, and, and his Savior. Until then would we occupy. And, and, and when you look deeper into why are we not occupying, what is stopping us from, from delivering on this assignment? Why have we not taken possession? Why is the authority here or now not representing or not replicating the kingdom that's in, that's in, that is in heaven? One of the main reasons is because we're not different from the world we're supposed to occupy. There is no distinction between you and I and the world that we're supposed to change. How do I know that? Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Romans chapter 12 said, and be not conformed to this world. That wasn't a suggestion. That was not an idea. That, in my opinion, was a, a, a caution, a reminder to say, wake up. You are different. There's a different assignment for you. There's a purpose for your life. There's a reason why you are still here. Don't get drawn into what this world is. Don't become like one of them because when you become one of them, you will not be able to change them. He said, be not conformed to this world. Okay, if I'm not going to be conformed to this world, what then do I have to do? What can I do as an individual? What can you do as a man? What can you do as a woman so that you are not exactly like the world that you are now supposed to change? He said, be transformed. Transformed how? By renewing your mind. By renewing your mind. By changing the, the, the operating system that is running your life, which is your mind. By making sure that the way you think, the way you see things, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you relate, the way you act, your, your belief system, your outlook in life, your encounter with people, your interaction with institutions, is totally, completely, distinctively different from what, what the others are doing. Renew your mind. Renew your mind how? By the word. What's the word? The word is the final authority. I call the word the manual for life. Every creator, every inventor, every producer, once they produce an item, they also bring it to the market with a manual of operation. And we have that. It is called the Bible. It's the manual for life. So if there's an area of your life and my life that has not been transformed, that has not been renewed, that is not allowing us to occupy till it comes, all we have to do is to go back to the manual and see what does the manual say we should do in this area? How does the manual say we should operate this system so that we can occupy? It said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove. 
that you may distinctively confirm, that you may demonstrate, that you may, you may show forth what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is that you and I should occupy. The good and the perfect and acceptable will of God is that the kingdom of earth must resemble the kingdom of heaven. The good, acceptable, perfect will of God is that you and I will take dominion and be in charge and dominate the affairs of this earth. By occupying till he comes. Because once that is done, there is nothing holding him back. He's coming back. But until we occupy, until our minds are transformed, until our world is renewed, until our view is changed, until our mindset is, is totally, completely overhauled, so that we may prove that, look, we're different. Not by saying it, but by acting it, by demonstrating it, by producing fruit that, that, that confirms that we're different. Because our minds have been renewed, our minds have been transformed, our eyes have been opened, our, our understanding has been enlightened. To know those things that are good, those things that are acceptable, those things that are the perfect will of our Father who is in heaven. We are not to, 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 to blend, to conform, to become one of them, to be part of them. The Bible said we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Unfortunately, a lot of us as Christians, we've lost the, the, the understanding that we are sojourners here. We are travelers. We're just passing through this earth. We're going home where we came from. We need to be transformed. We need to, to refuse to conform. We need, we need to refuse to be for this world to bend us and shape us and mold us into its time. We, there must be something about you. There must be something about me that when, when anybody sees us, whether Christians or non-Christians, they just know something is different about you. They just know something is different about us. They just know that we are not like all the other ones. But you can only give what you have. You can only give what you have. You cannot change anyone or anything if you have not changed yourself. If your mind is not renewed. If your outlook is not, is not transformed. If your lifestyle does not depict the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You can't change anybody because you can only give what you have. This world, this society, this planet is tired of hearing or saying the Bible say, oh, this is what the Bible said. My pastor said, my bishop said, my dear. The world is tired of saying if we are true sons of God, if you are true daughters of God, if there is a, a, a distinction between you and the world, demonstrate it. Show it forth. Don't tell us what you have. Show us what you have. It is the demonstration of the power of God in your life and in my life, through your life and through my life, that will draw men to our light. Do you know why it is easier to fill a hall by an evangelist than it is to fill a hall by a teacher? Because the evangelist is demonstrating, is showing forth. There is manifestation in what he's saying. You can see the blind heal. You see, you can see the lame walk. You can, and so it draws people. That's what the world is looking for demonstration of the power of God. We need to dominate this earth 
by spreading the flavor of the kingdom by showing forth the the the, the beauty of our of our of our god by letting the world see that the only thing we are made up of the only thing that we carry all the things that we are embodied with is peace, is love, is joy. Because guess what? Those are the things that are missing in this world. No peace, no joy, no love, no kindness, no, no temperance, no, 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 nothing is working. And they're looking up to us to say, come on, guys, you said you know God, show forth. You said you are children of God, let us see. You said you are sent by God, demonstrate it. You said you are an agent, let's see what assignment you have under your heart. Your obedience and my obedience to fulfilling kingdom mandate is the solution that this world is waiting for. Your ability, my ability to demonstrate the power of God through you and I, because we are his agent and we are commissioned to bring forth change here on earth. Until we start to fulfill that mandate, this world will continue to ask, where's your God? This world will continue to wonder, is this God real? This world will continue to go down into the pit of hell in handbasket while we are playing church. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. They are waiting to say, hey, if only you would just... If only you would just, if only you would just, if only I will just, if only we will manifest who we confess and profess to be. Are you an agent of change? Are you an agent of change? In what area are you changing the environment that you occupy, the situation around you? What flavor are you are you releasing into into the atmosphere for this world to to follow with their noses to find where where the, the aroma is coming from? Do you want to be an agent of change? Would you like to be an agent of change? Would you reconsider accepting this mission and this commission that God has given to us to occupy? Till he comes. Because in order for you and I to become an agent of change, there are certain things that we must recognize. There are certain things we must we we need to to to, to revisit and, and take on board. There are certain things that we need to to to, to re-embrace. This truth, this th th truth, we need, we must, we have to lay hold of them. And stop playing religiosity. The first truth that we must we must take on board is the fact that we are the light of this world. Without you and I as born again Christians, children of God, this world is in the dark. We think this little light of man, I'm gonna let it shine. This no, our light is not little. Because irrespective of how tiny, how minute, how it almost insignificant light is, once it enters into any dark area, darkness will disappear. Darkness will vermouth. Darkness will, will, will completely vaporize. But you and I are the light of this world. Matthew chapter 4. Chapter 5, sorry, from verse 14 to 16. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 said, Ye are the light of the world. It's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's a confirmation. You are the light of the world. And just in case you're wondering what does that mean, he went on to say, You are a city that is set on a hill. You cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, 
but they put it on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. That's what your life and my life are supposed to be. We're supposed to be like the house that is built on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're supposed to be like the candle light, the candle that is lit and it's put on the candle stand so that everybody that comes in can see clearly. So now that you, we've been, we've, the, the description has been given that we are the light of the world. We have been given similitude of what we're supposed to look like. The, the house built on a hill. The candle put on a candlestick. Is now, now the instruction is, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine. How do you do that? How do you make your light so shine? How do you make this light shine brighter and brighter and bigger? He said, by your good works. What is your good work? By changing the decaying in this world, by changing the corruption in this world, by changing the diseases that's in this world, by changing the poverty that's in this world, by changing the lack that's in this world, by bringing answers to the, to the questions of this world. That's how you demonstrate your good work. And when men start to see your good work, when they start to see the manifestations of your light, when they start to see the, your light shining brighter and brighter, guess what? They will have no choice but to give glory to your Father which is in heaven, who commissioned you and I as agents of, agents of change here on earth. Because light is a change agent. But the question is, is your light shining? Is your light shining? Is this world feeling the effect of your life, which is supposed to be the light of this world? So the first thing you must, you must remind yourself, you must take on board as an agent of change is, I'm a light. I am the light of this world. There must be something different about me, in me, and through me that this world will have no choice but to, 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 to search out and seek out where this light is coming from, where this light is going. The second thing that you and I must bear in mind, that we must lay hold of, that we must carry and embody ourselves with, that we must remind ourselves, that we must, we, we must demonstrate, is that we're not just the light of this world. We are also the salt of this earth. We are the salt of this earth. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13. Matthew 5, 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Wow. You are the salt of this earth. I am the salt of this earth. But what if that salt has lost its favour? its savour? What if that salt has lost its purpose? What if that salt has lost its significance? What if that salt has become useless? What if that salt has lost its, its importance? What if that salt has lost the, the, the advantage that it brings to this world? How will it be salted? It will be good for nothing and it will just be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Now, let's be truthful. If true be told, is that not where the church is today? Is that not where the church of Christ is today? 
we oh yes we have the banner we have the emblem we have the label we have the the dance and the jump and the lingo and the this and the that but we're not really tasting there is no no salty taste left in us we have lost the salve of us of, of of what the salt of what salt should be to this world and that is why men are not bothered when you say you're a christian anymore that is why people don't pay attention when you say you are a born again person anymore. That is why the church has no voice anymore here on earth. And men just say, oh yeah, another one of them. That is how they're trodden us under their feet. Because we have lost our serve our salt. How do I know that? Because when you look at the characteristics of salt, when you look at the, the embodiment of salt, what salt represents you, will, and you will align that with, with, with your life and the life of the Christendom, when you, you lay them side by side, you, will, you, you have, unless you are going to deceive yourself. Salt, number one, is a sweetener. These are the characteristics of salt. Salt is a sweetener. It makes food taste sweet. It gives food taste. It gives flavor. It, 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 it lifts up a dull moment in a, in a bowl of soup. But the question is, if you are the salt of the earth, if you are supposed to sweeten this earth, what taste do you leave in people's mouth after they walk away from meeting you? Is it a sweet one or is it a sour one? Is it a good taste or a bad taste? Would they be looking forward to meeting you again or would they say, till Jesus come, I don't want to see that person again? Are you a sweetener? Another characteristic of, us, of salt is that salt it's, a, it's, a, it's an agent of preservative. It preserves things from going bad. It pre preserves things from going decay. It preserves things from, from rotting. But when you look at your life and my life, when you look at your church and my church, when you look at your pastor and my pastor, when you look at the body of Christ as we are, would you say we are preservatives in our activities, in our actions, in our words, in the things that we do? When people meet you, when, when you interact with people, what condition do you leave them? Are they preserved or are they more damaged? Are they preserved or are they more wounded? Are they preserved or are they more condemned? To rot away. Because if you are the salt of this earth, that's what you should do. Salt is a seasoner. But what value are you adding to people? Or are you depleting them when they encounter you? If you are the salt of this earth, you are supposed to season people's life. Make them look better. Make them feel better. Make them know better. Make them act better. Make them... Make them See, just become better. When you look at the grains of salt, you can see it is shining. It's glittering. It's, it's just sparkling. Does your life radiate such characteristics? Is your life, your life and my life, are they shining? Are they glittering? Are they sparkling? Is it, is it, does it make people want to look the second time to say, wow, did I see that? Or do they look second time to say, wow, and you call yourself a Christian? Are you the salt of this earth? Are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? As an agent of change, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? I know the two sounds or looks like the same, but you see, when you look at the two of them, they, they perform differently. 
A thermostat measures the temperature, gives you the information, and that's all it does. Maybe that's who we are. Oh, we tell the world, Jesus is coming soon. Oh, yes, we tell them, you are going to hell. We tell them, join us now and get on this train that's going to heaven. We, we measure the temperature. That's all we do. But as an agent of change, you have to become a thermostat. That when a thermostat measures or recognizes the, the atmospheric condition in an environment, it changes it. If it's too hot, it brings it down to cool. If it's too cold, it lifts the temperature up to make it warm so that people can feel comfortable. Have you been, especially in this season that is very cold, you left your car outside overnight and then in the morning you're going to work, you open the door, you're like, Whoo, what do you do? Do you just leave it like that? Or you put your car on, turn the heating off, and set the thermostat to lift the temperature to what makes it conducive. As an agent of change, it's your life and my life. Is it a reflection of a thermostat or a reflection of a thermometer? Because as Christians, when we meet unbelievers, when we meet non-church people, when we meet non, non pe people that are not worshipping God like we do or going to our church or behaving like we are, we're very good to tell them, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And did it. You know what has been happening lately? Every time you quote John 3, 16 to an unbeliever, they turn around and say, okay, have you read Revelation 3.16? Revelation 3.16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, I neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. If you are a Christian, and you are neither cold nor hot, who are you to go and preach John 3.16 to anybody? So next time, before you open your Bible to John 3.16, read from Revelation 3.16 and determine whether you are the one being described as lukewarm. Because unless you become a firebrand, unless you become too hot to handle, unless you become too hot to touch, you are not changing anything. You are not an agent of change and you are not occupying and that's why he's not coming. Because John 14, 5, the gospel of John chapter 1, sorry, from verse 4 to 5 said, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. Now, that's a change. In him was life. That life was the light of men. And that light, it shined in darkness. And in all of its power, the darkness cannot hold it, cannot comprehend it, cannot stand it, cannot withhold it, cannot stop it. As soon as the light shines, darkness goes, boom, out of the, out of the, out of the window. Change. Change. Become a change agent for your God. If you are a true disciple, if you are a true believer, if you are a true follower, if you are a true Christian, if you are a true son and daughter of God, do something, change something, bring change to your environment. Let your light so shine. That darkness cannot comprehend it. Quickly, what are the requirements? What are the things that you and I need to do 
what do we need to become what do we need to have to become agent of change what is it what are the ingredients that we are missing that has not that that is stopping us from manifesting in the trueness of agents of God and helping us and giving us the ability to occupy till it comes. What are those things that we're missing? What are those things that we don't have or we are not doing or we're not seeing? What are the characteristics? What are the requirements that is that we need to take on board in order for us to ma maximally produce as agents of change? The first one is that we must be filled with the Spirit of God. We must be filled with the Spirit of God. I'm not talking of uh, 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 just because you can speak in tongues. No. That's the baptismal of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying you must be filled with the Spirit of God. Because you cannot fulfill a heavenly mandate in the arms of flesh. You cannot fulfill this assignment using your physical, your natural strength. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God. Even Jesus Christ, the begotten Son of God, in all of his glory, in everything that, that he is, as, as the, the second head of the Trinity, he came to this earth and until he was filled, Filled with the Spirit of God. He couldn't do nothing. If Jesus couldn't, couldn't do it, why do you think, what, what, how, what makes you think you can do it? And that's why he said in Luke 4, from verse 18 to 19, Luke chapter 4, from verse 18 to 19, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh. Immediately, at that instance, everything changed. At that moment, the true manifestation of Jesus Christ as the agent of change here on earth kicked into action. How do I know that? Read on. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Change. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, change. To preach deliverance to the captive, change. Recovering of sight to the blind, change. To set at liberty them that are bruised, change. To preach the accept acceptable year of the Lord, change. Do you think somebody who is blind and miraculously, their eyes are open. You think there's a change in that person's life? I bet there is. Somebody that is locked up in prison, and one day the prison door is open and they say, you are free to go. You think there's a change in his or her life? I bet there is. But all of that, all of those changes are manifestations of the spirit of the Lord that is in him and that's on him. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and I am anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. What's the gospel to the poor? What's the change that a poor man needs? Is to become rich, to become well, well endowed. A broken hearted person, what's the change they need for their hearts to be mended, to be healed, to be restored? Those in captives, what's the change they're looking for? To be set free. Deliverance to those who are in captive. Ladies and gentlemen, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not in words, but it's in the demonstration of the power of God. Until you start to demonstrate the power of God, people are not paying attention to the kingdom that you carry. People are not listening 
to the message that you preach. People are not paying attention to the okie-koki dance that you are doing. People can't be bothered by the size of your church until they can see the demonstration of the power of God. And all of that starts with you being filled with the Spirit of the Lord, with you being occupied with this by the Spirit of the Lord, with your, your inner self being dominated by the Spirit of God. Because whatever you see on the outside, they are just manifestations of what is going on on the inside. They are a, rep a, a, a representation of what is happening on the inside. That's why you type on your keyboard and the letters are showing on your monitor or your, or your screen. Because what's going on on the inside you can, is what you are seeing on the outside. I like what uh, Elizabeth Kobler-Ross said. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross, he said, people or Christians in this instance. He said, people are like stainless glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out. But when darkness sets in, in their, when darkness sets in, that is when their true beauty is revealed only if there is a light from within. Christians, your life and my life, we are like the stainless glass window. Oh, just shine some light and you could see it sparkling, shining and, and just dramatizing and making all the noise. But wait till when darkness sets in. Wait till when there is an issue in that person's life. When you are in church on Sunday, oh yes, you are the best dancer. You sing the loudest. You shout amen the loudest. You are the best preacher. You are the best apostle. You are the best everything when you are in church. Until you get home and there is headache. Until you get home and your bills are not paid. Until you get home and your, your manager says, well, this is it. We're going to let you go. Until you get home and your child is 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 not feeling well. Until you get home and you have to deal with the challenges of life. That's the darkness. When the darkness sets in, your true beauty as a Christian will be reflected if there is enough light on the inside to shine through the stainless glass. That we see on the outside. Question. Is there light on the inside? How bright is the light on the inside? Because that's what will make people pay attention. A good example of this can be found in Daniel chapter 6 from verse 3. Daniel chapter 6 from verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the president and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. That's all. That is the difference maker, ladies and gentlemen. The excellent spirit, which is the spirit of God, was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole affairs. Daniel was an agent of change because an excellent spirit was in him. The spirit of God was found in him. The spirit of God dwelt on the inside of him. When darkness came, he was not bothered because there is enough rays of this light shining from the inside. And the king had no choice but to see it and pay attention. Is that light shining in your life today? The Bible said the king could not find any fault in Daniel concerning the kingdom because he was faithful without error. He was without fault. You know why? Because an excellent spirit was found in him. People conspired. 
they ganged up. They brought accusation against Daniel. Yet, because an excellent spirit was found in him, Jesus said to the people who came to arrest him, he said, there is nothing in me, there's nothing on me, there's nothing about me that you can hold me. The devil has nothing on me because an excellent spirit, the spirit of God was in him. Question, should we approach your pastor right now? Pastor, should we ask your congregation right now? Will they give the same report about you? Will they say the same thing about me? That all oh, regarding that person, there is no fault found in him because the Spirit of God was in him or is in him. Daniel was well was known by all, all and asunder. That he was a faithful man. He was a man that carries the essence and the presence of God everywhere he goes. He was faithful to, to his God. He was faithful to the kingdom. He was faithful even to the king. He was faithful to the system. He was faithful in everything because an excellent spirit, the spirit of God was found in him. He was filled with the spirit of God. He brought change to the world. He changed the story of this world because an excellent spirit was found in him. Because the spirit of God was on him, in him, and it was manifesting and bringing change to the world. The second thing that you need to do or become or have in order for you to really demonstrate that you are an agent of change is that you must put your trust in the Lord. You must put your trust in God and God alone. Psalms 118 verse 8 said, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Do you know why? He will not fail you. He will never disappoint you. He will not promise you what he cannot deliver. He will not take you where he cannot keep you. He will not bring you to where you, his provision is not enough for you. But if you put your trust in man, they would fail you. They would disappoint you. They would discourage you. They would drop you. They will break you. You know, when Daniel was, was going through this, these challenges that he was, he was dealing with about being thrown into the lion's den, he didn't even bother telling the, his other Hebrew boys because his, his trust was in the Lord. He trusted God enough that when the king said, well, Daniel, because of this, you are going to the lion's den, he said, call the taxi, I'm ready. But look at what happened. Look at how that trust in the Lord, that singular element of his trust in the Lord, look at how he brought change to the whole land. In Daniel chapter 6 from verse 25 to 27, Daniel chapter 6 from verse 25 to 27, then King Darius wrote unto all people, now Daniel has been put in the lions there, and the lions turned themselves into a pillow and, and, and blanket and kept him warm all through the night. So the king came in the morning and said, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And Daniel said, King, I'm here. I'm ready to come out. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, all nations, all languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Boom. Now that's change. 
that is an agent of change throughout the whole earth king darius said everybody must tremble and must fear and must serve the god that daniel serves why he said for he is the living god and is steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end he delivered and rescued and he worked signs and wonders in heaven and in earth because he had delivered daniel from the power of the lions because one man never say oh it's just me i can what can i do well i mean it's don't let me no when God is when God is ready to move, He doesn't move with the crowd. He looks for one, that one person, that will that will show Himself or herself faithful. That one person that will yield completely, that will trust in the Lord, that will allow the Spirit of God to fill him or her. God will find that one person. Is that you, or is that me today? The whole kingdom, the whole earth was converted to serve and to worship the living God because a man, one man, Daniel, chose to be an agent of change and put his trust in God. One man. So before you write yourself off, before you condemn yourself, before you, th you see yourself, as insignificant, insignificant. What can I do? I mean, do you look at the vast seven billion people in the world. What can only me do? There you go. The whole earth was commanded to serve the God of Daniel because he chose to put his trust in the Lord as an agent of change. You know, the Bible said something. It said, "No soldier goes to war at his own expense." If God has commissioned us as agents to bring change to this earth, you think he will just give us the assignment and walk away? He equipped us with what is required, what is necessary to deliver maximally. Look at Esther. Esther trusted in the Lord for favor. He trusted in the Lord. He, he, he pulled all the children of Israel on a fast so that he can go before the king. And he went. He said, if she said, if I perish, I perish. She went and found favor. And by that one act of change as an agent, the whole tribe of Jews, the whole children of Israel were saved from destruction. And all the enemies that were planning and ganging up against them, they were destroyed. Because one woman, one young lady, Esther, chose to be an agent of change. Look at David. David trusted in the Lord. A shepherd boy put his trust in the Lord. Why all the seasoned army of Israel were cowering and running away just from the voice of Goliath. David trusted in the Lord. He said, I am a representative of this God. I am an agent of change. And he took care of Goliath and delivered the children of Israel from the harassment of this Philistine. Because he chose to be an agent of change. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not by power, it's not by mind, it's by the Spirit of God, by the level of the trust that we have invested in our God. That is what will give us the result. Forget about all this gimmick and all these pranks and all this, this, this looting and everything going on in churches today, all in the name of God said, God said. No. If God said, you will see the full manifestation of it. What have you invested your trust in today?
is in your job, in your finance, in your connection, in your in your father, in your parents, in your whatever. Whatever it is you have attached your trust to today that is not of God. It's a temporary thing. It will fail. It will not stand the test of time. But when your trust is in God, you can take it to the bank. How are we doing for time? Quickly. The third thing that you must become, that you need to take on board to really manifest as an agent of change is faithfulness. 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 Full of faithness. Faithfulness. Be faithful to what God has assigned to you. He said, if you are faithful over that which is little, then I will make you ruler over that which is much. But everybody's on is we are everybody's in this rat race. My church must be bigger, my building must be bigger, my congregation must be bigger, we must sing louder. We must there are so many people in the pulpit today that are not supposed to be there. Does that, does that mean they're not called of God? No, I'm not saying they're not called of God. But some are called as... You remember the fivefold ministries? The pastor, the teacher, evangelist, apostle, and the prophet. But instead for people to identify their position and their calling and their assignment and stay faithful to it, everybody wants to build a church so that the congregation can bring their tithes, so that the pastor can live large, so that the please you want to be an agent of change stay in your lane you want to be an agent of change stay in your lane be faithful to your assignment be faithful to that which God has given you because until you are faithful to that you will not you will you will, you will not be effective in whatever else you are doing you will not be effective in whatever area you are you are operating in i remember when i read about it or heard about it of 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 father hagen when he started out in ministry he was a pastor and there was this and and then one day god said are you ready to start your ministry now? And it's like, are you for real? What do you mean start your ministry? All this that I've been doing, what, what do you call that? And God said, well, you've been doing your thing. Well, that's not what I called you to be. I called you to be a teacher, not an evangelist, not a pastor. Because of that one instruction. Father Hagen remain, or blessed memory remain a general today in the things of God because he listened, he heard, he obeyed, he remained faithful to his assignment once he found it. Be faithful to what has been assigned to you. Look at the life of Apostle Paul. What a great man of God. Apostle Paul was a great change agent because he was faithful to his assignment. Both when he was sold in persecuting the church, you can't get a better persecutor than that. And when he converted and become Paul, he, you couldn't get a better disciple of Jesus Christ than that. Even the 12 or the 11 that ate and, and, and walked with Jesus and, and sat with him. Apostle Peter was saying there are some revelations from Paul. Even those of us who were with Jesus, we don't understand it. But you know what happened to Paul? Paul was sent primarily to the Gentiles. 
But the day Paul decided to go and visit the Jews, he was captured. He was humiliated. He was imprisoned. And eventually he got killed. Peter was sent to the Jews. But when he went to the Gentiles, they whoop his tail. Be faithful to what has been commissioned to you. You know one of the ingredients that will keep you grounded in your calling, in your assignment, is by reminding yourself of the day that God put his hand on you. For as long as you remain, you keep that in, your, in, in front of your eyes. You know, the Bible said you will hear a voice behind you who will say, this is the way, walk ye in it. You will not turn to the left, left or to the right. You will be faithful. You will remain faithful. And when you remain faithful to your calling, to your purpose, to your assignment, now you can make a change. Now you can bring change. Now you can de de deliver change as an agent of God. My book, Elisha Project, The Privilege of Serving Leaders, there's a whole chapter, a whole chapter dedicated to faithfulness. You need to read that, not because I'm trying to sell, sell my books, but I'm telling you, faithfulness is so paramount in everything that you do with God and for God. You need to be faithful. Number four. You need to develop passion for his kingdom. You want to really demonstrate and, and act out your agent, agency, your calling as an agent of change. Your, you want to really occupy before he comes. You need to develop passion for his kingdom. What is passion? Passion is a strong and barely control, controllable emotion. You need to dis, de, develop strong passion for his kingdom, for his purpose, for his calling, for his task, for his souls. Look in John chapter 2, the gospel of John chapter 2 from verse 15 to 17. John chapter 2 from verse, verse 15 to 17, he said, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take this things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The zeal, the passion for his father's house consumed him, Jesus so much so he pulled out a whip and whooped their tail and drove them all out of the temple. Look at Nehemiah. When Nehemiah was told in Nehemiah chapter 1 from verse 3 to verse 4, when he was told about what has happened to the walls of Jerusalem, how the remnants been scattered. When he heard this word, the Bible said he sat down and wept and mourned for seven days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When the passion for God's kingdom consumes you, it will spur you into action beyond your natural ability. Because now Nehemiah went to the king, got permission. Got authority from the king and they went back and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem with one hand working and one hand with the sword. And that's how the walls of Jerusalem was, was rebuilt because a man was, con con was consumed by the passion for his kingdom and he brought change to the land. Remember the story of the three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 3, verse 28 to 30. When they refused to bow down to the, to the, to, to, to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. 
And the Kazarian said, they will throw them in the fire, in the fiery furnace. Even the people that took them there were consumed. And these three boys went in and they were just having party with the Son of God. Why? The passion. The passion for his kingdom. I'm not talking about passion for your denomination, passion for your pastor, passion for your practices and your religious activities and your events. No, I'm saying for his kingdom. Because unfortunately, as Christians, our passion now has been turned from God into our pastors. Our passion has been taken from God and placed them on our bishops, on our geos, on our reverend, on our leaders, on the name of the church, on the symbol of the church, on the emblem of the church, on the events and the, the characteristics that, 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 that identifies our church. No. That's a misplaced priority. Our passion, our commitment, our dedication, our purpose must be to him and his kingdom. When these Hebrew boys refused to bow down and they were delivered from the fire with not even the smell of a smoke on them. Look at what Nebuchadnezzar said. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servant that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Again, another decree. That every people Every nation, every language will speak anything amiss, any wrong pronunciation, any mindset that is contrary, that is against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those people will be cut in pieces, their houses will be burned, and turn into a dung hill. Why? He said, because there is no other God that can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon because they chose to be agents of change. Their passion for him and for his kingdom, for his purpose, for his decree, for his law, their passion for God forced the king to change the law of the entire known world. So it happened with Daniel. Now we're seeing it with the other three Hebrew boys. My prayer tonight, my, my confession tonight is to say, Lord, set me on fire so the world can see me burn for you. Ignite in me this passion for your kingdom that will bring change to this land. What is it about you as we round up, in what area can you become an agent of change right now? In what aspect of all these four or five things that we've listed out tonight, what aspect of it do you need to lay hold of and run with so that you can truly demonstrate that you're an agent of change? My prayer is you will find the courage, the, the guts, the 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 the, the wherewithal to run passionately after it. My prayer is that the spirit of God will come upon you. My prayer is that you will put your trust in God and in Him alone. My prayer is that you will be faithful to His calling, to His assignment, to His purpose, so that together we can bring change. A lasting change to this earth as we're commanded to occupy till it come. Maybe you are watching this program tonight or at any point in time and you're wondering what is he shouting about? What is this about agent of change or change of change? Let me tell you. You need to, to become an agent of change. You have to be enlisted in the army.
first. You have to first of all establish a personal, undeniable relationship with God through His Son Jesus Christ. So if you are watching this program and you don't have that relationship, you don't have that relationship with God, tonight is your night. Tonight is the night that you can enlist in this army of change. Tonight is the night. Now is the day of salvation. Let me introduce you to this God we're talking about. And let him brand your heart and your life with his purpose. And that you can go forth and bring this change to this earth. You can go forth and occupy until he returns. If that's you tonight, or maybe you are once enlisted as an agent of change. Maybe you once had a relationship with him. Maybe you once was a follower of, of, his, of, of, of his love and his passion. And somewhere along the line, something happened and you, you, choose, you decide to, to do something else. Your membership, your enrollment in this army.